plant down in Pittsburgh. So we're just on the other side of Jordan Lake and um, we do offer tours every Sunday afternoon at one o'clock. So when the in-laws are in town and you're bored, drive across the lake and, uh, and join us if you can. We have uh, been the subject of books and um, articles and movies and so on. This is my latest book. So my suggestion is after you leave here, you go up to Quail Ridge and buy as many copies as you can possibly <laughs> So our, our story begins with deep frying turkeys. And when you deep fry a turkey, you get about four or five gallons of cooking oil and you get it really hot and you lower the bird into it. And it sears all of the juices into it. And if you've never had a deep fried turkey, it's quite a culinary treat and experience. But when you're done, you end up with four or five gallons of used cooking oil. And when you take that used cooking oil and you throw it in the woods, you notice that the dogs and the bugs and all sorts of vermin are attracted to it. It's very obvious that you're dumping out good energy. So back in 2002, I would be deep frying turkeys and I would get a blender and I would take my used cooking oil and turn it into biodiesel. And I would take the biodiesel and I would put it into my diesel tractor. So I live on a farm in Chatham County, which isn't really a farm, but I do use a tractor to mow the fields and grade the lane and skid firewood. So I would make a little blender batch of fuel and I would put it into my tractor and that's how I was uh, powering myself with the scraps from deep fried turkeys. Rachel comes along and puts on a class at Central Carolina Community College and suddenly, and so does uh, uh, her buddy Leaf, and um, they want to make enough fuel to power their families too. So we started a very small scale in the backyard um, hmm. biodiesel plant. And you know, it's one thing to make fuel for your tractor, it's another thing to try to power your family car and now Rachel's family car and now Lee's family car. And so we just kept scaling up and we would start with, uh, I think when Rachel and I got our first 10 gallon batch of biodiesel to actually work, there were maybe six people standing around clapping. So everybody got a gallon and a half to go home. <laughs> <laughs> and we started, and you know, we went from a 30 gallon reactor, and then we, we built a 55 gallon reactor that we don't talk about because it blew up, and then we, uh, we got to a 70 gallon reactor, and, and so on. And we ended up forming a cooperative. So Piedmont Biofuels is a cooperative, and when we did that, this guy shows up and he had this double wide in the woods that he was going to bulldoze, but he decided that since we were cooperative and since he wanted some fuel, he was going to join and we could have it. So we got this magnificent place for, I think, three years for a dollar. And um, we built a little biodiesel plan and we were cooperatively making biodiesel. So 10 guys would get together and they would make 100 gallons of fuel and everyone would get 10 gallons to go home on. And that's uh, where we began. The cooperative notion really came from Leaf, who lived in a co-op house and he shopped at a co-op grocery store and he thought that you know, everything in the world should be cooperative. Uh, we didn't know any better, so we became one. <laughs> this, is, uh, this was a, the early plant, and you can see um, all of the really expensive uh, gear there. I think the nicest part of it was probably the kitchen sink, which we found in the woods, and uh, you know, critically important. This is 2002, and I would say that people at the time just thought we were quirky. We had no plan, we were just jumping in. And at that time, you could really go to almost any 
restaurant or food service place in the triangle and you could say, you know, hey, I'm, I need some grease to make some fuel for my family. You know, you got a dumpster up back, can I help myself? And they would always be, help yourself, absolutely, take more, come back, you know. And weirdo, I think, was sort of understood. <laughs> so we started out, people just thought we were quirky. And then, around 2005, there was really a big uptake in biofuels. Biofuels were going to save the world, and we became extremely sexy. So what happened was, everybody was going to drive around in cars powered by soybeans in the future, and we were at the forefront of it, and everything was going to be fine because there was this thing called biofuels. And uh, Leaf and Rachel and I became rock stars in this, um, in this movement, and really nationally. We, we ended up with a national voice in this uh, topic. Along comes 2008, and that's when the global commodity prices go to the ceiling. That's when a barrel of oil hit $139. And that's when the United Nations decided anyone involved with biofuels should be charged with crimes against humanity. That's when we were on the front cover of Time magazine as the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on the American public. And that's when we went from sexy to evil. And it's easy to think of biofuels as being evil because biofuels are not without sin. And that is, let's do this. Let's. Um, burn down the rainforest in Malaysia and plant oil palm trees like these all in a row. Let's harvest the seeds, squish them, take the oil out, put it on a super tanker, send the super tanker to Seattle where there's a hundred million gallon biodiesel plant in the harbor. Let's turn it into biodiesel, put it on a train, send it to Raleigh, North Carolina, put it in a truck and let's take it out to the airport and when they've burned enough of it, let's give them a prize for being green. Okay. Stop the madness. Um, biofuels uh, are guilty of this, and biofuels are... Uh, the, the opposite also happens. At one point, when the US dollar went into the hopper and the euro was still strong, the Europeans came over and they bought all of the poultry fat in the southeastern United States. And they, they came to all the biodiesel producers and said, Hey guys, now that we own all the fat that you need to make fuel, how about if you make fuel for us? And a bunch of us, including Piedmont, said, well, okay. So they rented a three million gallon tank in the Savannah Harbor and every day and a half we would load a truck with biodiesel and send it down to Savannah and Savannah, when they had enough, they would put it on a super tanker and then take the super tanker over to Rotterdam and then blend it into the European fuel supply so some guy on the London street corner could fill up his smart car and call himself green. Now, again, stop the madness, biofuels, guilty. So, I've been quirky. And I've been sexy, and I've been evil, and I guess I think sexy is better. <laughs> we went down to uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, we bought a little abandoned industrial plant, and uh, uh, the town said, well, if you're going to do this, you've got to change the name of the road, and so we called it Lorax Lane. This was before the <laughs> We had to weld this guy to the pole because uh, the first one got stolen. <laughs> and we built a million gallon biodiesel plant, and that's where I work uh, today. And by the way, when you're working in biodiesel, it destroys your clothes. That's why I uh, wear a uniform. Um, so we built a million gallon plant, and we did it out of this abandoned aluminum factory. And uh, it had a whole bunch of abandoned buildings and uh, uh, so on. So making money in biodiesel is uh, theoretically drop dead simple. It starts with a truck like this. We have a few hundred restaurants that we collect from. M many of them are in Raleigh. So if this truck goes out every morning empty and sucks grease and comes home every night full, you just follow it on with a truck like this, which you put the finished fuel on. And all you really have to do is make sure that this truck leaves full every day and comes home empty. And if you can just have that happening, you would have a license to print money. We've been at it 10 years. We made a profit in 2011. We made a little profit in 2012. So it isn't exactly um, as simple as we thought. And there are a lot of dead bodies in biodiesel. Anyway, the uh, point is that um, one of the lessons that we get to learn, and this was talking to Matt earlier, is when you're doing this, you think that it's about BTUs, or you think it's about technology, or you think it's about getting enough grease, or you think it's about complicated chemical reactions. And you tend to forget that what it's actually about is the people that want to run around on this fuel. So our cooperative today has about 400 members. It's the largest biodiesel cooperative in the country. 
And so we're powering about 400 triangle families who are running around on our fuel. We also sell some to oil companies as well. Along the way, we built a farm, and the farm, which is uh, Piedmont Biofarm, uh, we got to learn the same lesson. When you go into farming, you think that it's about bed structure and soils, and you think it's about you know uh, rows and fences and irrigation and all these technical things. Um, we developed a pepper, the Pittsburgh pepper. Uh, some of you may have heard of the pepper festival that happens in Pittsburgh every fall. Uh, this is a bioregionally specific sweet pepper that does really well with our diseases and our funguses and our uh, pests. Uh, and you think it's about getting the right sort of seed bank. You think it's about picking the okra on time and the right uh, exhaust fan for the greenhouse. Or you think it's about value add. How can you get more for your popcorn if you grow different colors and, and organize it this way and sell it in fancy jars? <laughs> and, uh, but really, it's about the people that want to eat this kind of food. So it's very easy for us to lose our way and, um, and we get to learn this lesson over and over again. One of the things we do at Piedmont is we try to pay attention to capital and we try to think about keeping capital in balance. So we live on the other side of Jordan Lake, which is this giant you know, chunk of natural capital that is right in our midst. And our natural capital in Pittsburgh is actually quite high right now. I would say our natural, cap natural capital account is full it's also at risk. So some Raleigh developers have bought up 6,000 acres of our community and want to build, uh, some people call it a mini RTP, but I don't think RTP is 6,000 acres. So it's actually a program that would be, a project that would be larger than uh, RTP. So they have this vision. So I would say our natural capital right now is in good shape, but it's also very much at risk. As soon as the Army Corps of Engineers figures out that the government is broke, they'll probably sell the lake off and we'll be able to see you know, docks and uh, McMansions everywhere. Uh, we have our built capital. This is what an aerial photograph, this is what a 30 year old aerial photograph, this is a pre-Google look at buildings. And um, this is our little park that we inhabit. Um, we pay attention to what we've invested in our built capital, and I would include our fleet in, in that. So we have our natural capital, we have our built capital. The whole trick is balance. The trick is to make sure that you don't have too much of one and not enough of the other. And uh, it's also true of our human capital the people that do the work. Uh, we've got a great bunch of talented folks and we've benefited from terrific human capital over the years. Uh, but again, we, we need to keep that in balance. And we need to combine that with social capital. Pittsburgh only has 3,500 people. Uh, this is some uh, molasses making. We, we grow some sorghum and every fall we, we turn it into sorghum syrup. And that's sort of a social activity that we do. The neat thing about Pittsburgh is uh, our social capital is quite high. Everybody knows your name when you go to the grocery store and, and so on. The other uh, capital to keep in balance is um, you know, financial. And so this is a photo of my wallet. And included is my Piedmont Biofuels membership uh, card, but also the Plenty, which is our um, local currency that we use in Pittsburgh. And that uh, is something that circulates around town. And uh, again, Keeping our financial capital in balance is a, is a critical part. If all you have is money and no talent, uh, you get nowhere. If all you have is um, talent and no money, you're in the uh, same boat. So we try to keep all of that aligned. One of the projects that we did is called Solar Double Cropping. And so this is a utility scale solar array and we built it above one of our farm fields. This is an idea that originated up in Ontario, Canada, where they passed a law saying no more solar on farmland. So up in Canada, it became so lucrative to make solar electricity that that became the you know, best use of the land. So people were coming in and buying up 5,000 acres of wine country, bulldozing it to put in solar panels. And all the solar panels are three feet off the ground. That's a typical solar farm, and that's all you can do with that land. Blue panels for as far as the eye can see. We build these ones up above the farm. Half of the light energy that hits this field is converted into electricity, which is used by our plant, and half of the light energy that hits this field is allowed to grow things on. And again, when you're doing a project like this, you think it's about soil compaction, you think it's about electrons, you think it's about green attributes, but in fact, it's about the people who care about clean energy. We've done a bunch of education and outreach. We've, uh, we've got kids that come on tour. We have thousands of visitors each year, and we try to preach the gospel. I would say, you know, a million-gallon plant, we're just sort of demonstrative in terms of 
the, the overall project. We put on workshops, we have some do-it-yourself workshops that we do at the plant, everything from beekeeper, beekeeping to um, making your own bread to stream <coughs> stewardship and, and so on. And uh, a while back this puzzle came up. This is a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle about our project and I think it's symbolic in the fact that we do feel that sustainability kind of feels like working on a jigsaw puzzle down at the beach. So, you know, we're all at the card table and one person is working on feedstocks and another person's working on technology and another person's working on markets and we're just all sort of sitting there passing pieces around and trying to um, solve this puzzle. We were pretty naive. We didn't know that we were going into the policy business. This is Kay Hagan and Senator Dordman, and this is when he was the chair of the Senate Energy Committee. So he was a pretty powerful senator for energy in this country at the time that they came to visit the plant to learn about biodiesel. We were naive and then we thought we would just make fuel and put it on trucks, but when you go into the energy business in this country, you're going into the policy business, which means you will be down at the state house and you will be um, wrestling with policy issues, and so we have found ourselves in policy, like it or not. We've also gone into research, and so we've had a bunch of PhDs around the place, and we've developed a new method of making biodiesel using enzymes rather than the chemical pathway that we used to use. And that's actually going to allow us to go deeper into the waste stream. So, you know, 10 years ago, all the dumpsters were open, help yourself, take as much as you want. In just 10 years, all the dumpsters in the triangle today are watertight, locked, and under contract. And in fact, our um, beneficent legislatures passed a law which we call the Grease Police Bill, in which if you touch our dumpster, we can charge you with a felony offense. We fought that law for years, but uh, it's now in place. The point is that our enzymatic technology is going to allow us to get out of the dumpster. That's kind of the good stuff. That's the frying oil that they're done with, and it's going to allow us to get into crummier fat, soils, and greases. It's going to let us drill deeper into the waste stream. So today, behind every restaurant, there's a grease trap, and that grease trap gets sucked and hauled out into the country and um, land applied or, or composted or, you know, they basically charge the restaurant to pick up the uh, grease trap and then they pay to get rid of it. Ten years from now, that will be a sought-after resource that every uh, fuel maker in the land will be wanting and they'll be wanting to do it with enzymes, is my prediction. Okay, so, uh, again, we think that it's about enzymes, we think it's about chemicals, we think it's about complicated things, when in fact, all it is is about the people that want to run around on this fuel and want to find their way into the low carbon future that awaits us. And that's my talk. And I would be happy to take questions about anything. Yeah. Any So what's the activity that occurs at the plant now that you most enjoy that you didn't expect you would? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like running routes. I drive a truck, yeah. and we have two routes. We might be picking up, or we might be um, uh, delivering. And I kind of like, I, I never thought I would like being a truck driver, but <laughs> route work is kind of deeply satisfying. I actually, I prefer delivering to uh, picking up. Katie is here. She runs our dispatch. Katie, um, don't let this question get out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to spend the rest of my life on <laughs> Yes? Is there any, any value to the model where power plants are powered by this instead of vehicles themselves? Okay, that's a great question. And I would say that electricity is a lower form of life than uh, liquid fuels. So uh, people do use liquid fuels for, fuels for generators, and you can certainly make electricity out of uh, liquid fuels, but it's, from an energy perspective, it's the wrong way around. Um, uh, electrons are a lot easier to make than getting this sort of uh, embodied energy into a gallon of liquid, and, and uh, power plants and generators are extremely inefficient. So the concept of um, going to all this work to make a fuel, whether it's diesel or gasoline or anything, and then <coughs> burning it to make electricity is ass backwards. Would be, uh, <laughs> yes? Um, can you say something about how do you convert your car so that it can use this biodiesel and also can you buy it anywhere locally? Okay, so um, that was a plant. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> you do 
don't actually, uh, you don't actually convert your car. All you do is, if you have a diesel engine, you unscrew the fuel cap, you fill up, and you drive. So there's no calling your mechanic, there's no going under the hood, you don't do anything. You just run around on um, B100 biodiesel. Our dispenser in Raleigh is down at Larry's Beans, which is out behind Whitaker Mill. It's sort of, you know, uh, we have six locations in the Triangle and one down in Wilmington. So there are seven places where our members can fill up on fuel, and one of those is here in Raleigh. Yeah. Yes? When you talk about enzymes, uh, are, are you, what are you thinking about when you're talking about that? And what about the companies that have come out and are using algae in a, in a similar way to be able to create oil? Yeah, okay, great question. So the typical way you make biodiesel is you take methanol and you take a catalyst, which could be sodium or potassium, and then you take fat, any kind of fat, and you mix them all up, and if you have the recipe right, you get biodiesel. Enzymes replace the chemical catalyst. So instead of using potassium or, or uh, sodium, you use enzymes and you let them do the work. Uh, we partnered with a company up in Franklinton called Novozymes, and Novozymes is a giant global maker of enzymes. And so all we're doing is replacing the catalyst. The neat thing about the enzymatic uh, catalysis is that it'll allow us to use really rotten fats, oils, and greases, the stuff that's cheap, uh, stuff that's come out of the sewer system. Stuff that nobody wants right now, and um, that's what's exciting about it. So the chemical pathway, potassium or sodium, is more limited than the enzymatic pathway. That's why we're excited about enzymes. Um, algae. Okay. I'm a bit of an algae skeptic, but everyone in biodiesel loves to play the algae card. And the reason people love algae is because it replicates itself so quickly. So if you think about how much algae you can create in 24 hours versus how many fields of soybeans you can grow, uh, algae always wins. Uh, the problem with algae is, first of all, it's a big, big space. So it's almost a kingdom in and of itself. There's a lot of different kinds of algae. Not all of them create oil. So it's not like you go take algae out of your pond and squish it and you get fat. Because many, many, many kinds of algae don't have it, including any of our native strains of algae. So if you wanted to take an algae that does express fat and, and you put it into a pond in North Carolina, it would be outcompeted by the native strains of algae that are already there. So if you're going to do that, you're going to have to either kill all the native strains, which would be you know heavy um, pesticide, um, or maybe herbicide, what's the right word there? Um, or, you, or you're going to have to GMO your algae to be able to outcompete the native algae or you're going to have to be in some sort of uh, in, indoors. You could do, it, do the algae indoors, and as soon as you start doing that, you kind of lose some of the gains of being faster than soybeans. I'm a bit of an algae skeptic. Algae will come. There's a whole bunch of money pouring into algae right now. I think Exxon just put $750 million into an algae research project. But algae is a long ways out. It's, uh, it's out there with hydrogen in terms of the way that we're going to power ourselves. So, I went to lunch once at NC State with these professors, and they um, wanted a centrifuge. They needed a $500 centrifuge for their graduate student seminar so that they could make some algae oil that we could turn into fuel. And so I told them I'd be happy to, to donate the 500 bucks. Piedmont would donate the 500 bucks in exchange for one gallon of oil from algae. And um, they thought that was a great deal. All I wanted was one gallon of fuel and the blogging rights. And uh, I thought that would be a deal. I came back across the lake, and everyone on my project thought I was absolutely crazy. I became instantly the guy who would pay $500 for a gallon. <laughs> um, that word got out. And so I was up in Virginia at a Clean Cities conference, and I went ahead and said, yeah, I'll pay $500 for one gallon of algae. And there, there was a publisher of uh, Biodiesel magazine. He started running want ads in the back, saying, you know, here's this wacko from North Carolina. Who paid one, or, or one gallon, $500. And uh, many have tried, and no one has shipped me one gallon of oil <laughs> so far. And that's, it. that's not entirely true. Algae oil today, we do get some through the plant, actually. So I have made some fuel from algae oil. <coughs> algae oil today is worth about 500 bucks. And the reason it's worth about 500 bucks is it's very high in antioxidants. It's very high in omega-3 fatty acids. And so what they do with it is they, they grill the algae, they squish it, they take the oil, and they extract the good stuff from it and they put it into little tablets and they sell it at health food stores or in the you know have a section of Whole Foods and it's worth a fortune. And that's why nobody is showing up 
giving me uh, a gallon of this stuff <laughs> because it's more valuable as a, as a food. So I would say algae is a long, long ways out. Yes? What, what is the primary barrier to biofuels responsibly done like you're doing it, catching on? Fat. Cruel irony. Here we live in this obesity ep ep uh, epidemic, and uh, I'm not allowed to use human. Uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, there is a there was a plastic surgeon out in California who made some biodiesel out of human fat. Oh. Uh, he is he is living in Mexico right now. Uh, but no, fat is the limiting uh, is the limiting. Thing to, to scale. Like the reason this will never scale, that this will, you know, taking waste fats, oils, and greases from your community and turning them into fuel to power a subset of your community is a great idea. It works, it's available now. And, and we probably should have a biodiesel plant in every town in North Carolina uh, like ours. That's probably a good idea. But they're all going to be little. They're going to be 150,000 gallons here and 250,000 gallons there. Um, and to put it into context, North Carolina burns 4 million gallons of diesel fuel a day. You know, so the idea is if I had a million gallon tank and if I could work for a year, I could meet the needs of this economy for one day. Oh, sorry, I could not. I could get from 9 to 5 and I'd need another supplier after that. 4 million gallons a day. In fact, more folks Southern called me up the other day. Um, they were looking for fuel and they also burn 4 million gallons of diesel fuel a day. <coughs> So the notion that we're all going to run around on biodiesel from fat, soils, and greases is insane. It will never happen. We are one little tool in your sustainability toolbox. Uh, you can do it now. You can, you can shed your gasoline car. You can get a biodiesel or a, a bio little TDI. You can fill up on fuel and be free of the petroleum grid and so on. It's one little thing uh, that you can do, but it's not going to power our economy. Yes? So it sounds like from a scalability perspective, you've stumbled onto the cooperative model co-ops been around, credit unions, farmers cooperatives. Since it's not scalable, would you recommend that if someone else were starting one, do it as a co-op rather than a for-profit business? Um, not necessarily. Um, I think that one of the things we realize is that we have this bias in which we think co-op good, corporate evil. And I don't think that's right. Um, Farm Bureau, for instance, uh, is a co-op. You know, Farm Bureau. They are the like biggest um, what hom homophobic, non-environmental, like stick in the mud, fight every you know, defend the status quo um, organization I can name. They're, Farm Bureau is evil, right? But our Farm Bureau is Jesse Helms. They're a co-op. So you can be evil and be a co-op, and you can be good as a corporation. So it's, it, I don't think it's quite as black and white as that. I think that um, just because you're cooperative doesn't necessarily match you off the hook. Yeah? Can you speak to how the relationship between the members of your co-op and the company, what the members get out of it, how do they become a member, the benefits of being a member? Okay, so you pay $50 a year to belong, and you get a little membership card in the mail, and that membership card works at all of our locations. And all it does is enable you to buy our fuel. So if you're not a member, you can't buy our fuel. Um, and that's all it is. It's a consumer co-op that allows people to get the, the product. Um, what's the relationship to the members? We do elect a, a board of directors from the membership, so you get one vote. Um, and um, we have an annual meeting and you know, come up with an annual report. And, and then the board of directors, which is basically volunteers serving from the membership, guides are thinking about what is in the best use of the best interest of the members. So for instance, um, they wanted us to build a station down in Wilmington. And we thought, oh, that's crazy. It's too expensive. It's too far away. We'll lose our shirts. We can't uh, do that. But the uh, board of directors was like, no, you really want to build a station down in Wilmington. And so we ended up uh, building a station down in Wilmington, uh, largely because of our current uh, board of directors. So there's, it's also little stuff like that when our when our dispensers are, um, you know, needing a filter change or needing repairs or uh, are messy or whatever. Uh, it's about trying to give the users or the members the, the best uh, experience they can running around in our fuel. So all of this is a consumer co-op. It allows you to buy our fuel, and our fuel is typically more expensive than petroleum. 
Right now we're at four dollars and twenty cents a gallon, and petroleum on our side of the lake is at about four nineteen nine. Uh, so we're a tenth of a penny more expensive today, but you know, two months ago we were maybe a nickel uh, higher. Sometimes we're a dime higher. Most of our members do not join us to save money. In 2011, we did beat the street price of petroleum by 10 cents a gallon, averaging over the year. But, you know, I should say this. Our membership, they tend to drive TDIs. They tend, those, that's a turbo direct injection motor that will get 49 miles to the gallon. So they're sort of like Priuses. And they tend to walk, and they tend to ride bikes, and they take buses, and they don't really drive that much. So our average member uses 40 gallons a month. So you say, wow, I beat the price by 10 cents over the course of the year. Well, that saves you a whopping $2 a month, or $4 a month, so I saved you $48, and of course it costs you 50 bucks a year to belong. So it's not really a <laughs> And the membership is also a very strange place, okay? Um, uh, with apologies to Carol and Katie, the two members that I know about that are in the room, um, we have got these Far left-wing folks, the, the no war required people, the people that want to be off the petroleum grid. They, they don't want to be tithing to Halliburton. They don't want anything to do with war in, in Iraq, and they're going to be driving around on our, on our field. We've got those. We've got, um, by the way, when the, when the golf thing was on, when the BP was like pumping into the golf uh, every night, people were coming home to dead pelicans on the news, our, our control room uh, was just like crushed from people who shed their gas car, bought their diesel, and it's like, how do I get my membership card? And it's like, oh, we mail it to you. No, I'm going down to pick it up right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, get, we get that card. Okay. We get the soccer moms uh, who are clean air freaks. These are the, uh, you know, soccer mom, kids got asthma, doesn't want to run around on a polluting product. Our emissions profile is beautiful compared to the emissions of uh, um, petroleum. And um, so we get the clean air freaks. We get the geopolitical folks. Uh, and then we also get the far right-winged survivalist nut jobs. <laughs> you know, they want to make their own fuel, they want to hide from the man, they don't want to pay their road taxes, you know. <laughs> and, 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 you know, they're doing self-reliance, you know, they're doing the whole resilience thing. And so I get, I get some members that want to pay with constitutional silver, and I get hippie chicks that want to trade fuel for massage. In your wallet you had currency called Plenty, can yeah. you talk about that a little bit? Right, so Plenty is an acronym for Piedmont Local Economy Tender. It has nothing to do with Piedmont Biofuels. Uh, it started up in Carborough um, back, uh, I think around 2002. And, uh, you know, the concept is one way to measure the health of an economy is through monetary circulation. So if you take a dollar and you spend it at Quail Ridge, uh, you know, the concept is they're going to pay that, take that dollar uh, and use it to pay their local bookkeeper. And that local bookkeeper is going to go out to eat at a local restaurant. And the local restaurant goes to the local farmer and blah, 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 and the dollar is going to go around and around and around and before it leaves town. And, uh, which would be the opposite of, say, buying a book from Amazon, where you take your dollar and you send it off into the ether and never to be heard or seen again. So you can measure the strength of an economy through monetary circulation. So the concept behind a local currency is, well, you kind of got to spend it here because they don't take it in China. And therefore, it goes around and around and around in our town. So we accept plenties for fuel. Um, we have a bunch of people that get paid in plenties, or a portion of their pay gets paid in plenties. And you can use plenties at our local co-op grocery store. You can also use them at our local Piggly Wiggly. You can use them at you know most of the restaurants and bars and, and so on. And it says on the plenty, in um, in each other we trust. That's one of the, the taglines on the, the bank note. And um, actually, if you want, if you promise to give it back to me, I could probably send a plenty around. I might have some here. Um, there, I have a 20 plenty, but this is worth 20 bucks, so make sure I get this back. <laughs> the idea is, uh, in each other, tr I trust. That, we trust. That's exactly the same thing that backs Federal Reserve notes. Right? The only reason you accept a dollar is because you can use that dollar to buy the goods or services that you need. So, you know, I'm not going to take the dollar if I can't get a beer with it. 
Um, and the plenty is backed by exactly the same thing, which is trust that you can get what you need. And so it's kind of neat in our town because you can do almost anything. You can pay your rent in plenties. You can go down to Capital Bank in our town and you can um, exchange them for Federal Reserve notes. So if you've got a wallet full of plenties and you're on your way to the beach where they don't take plenties, you can run down to the bank and turn them back into US dollars and um, go to the beach. Um, and so uh, because of that, I mean, you could, you could pay your mortgage in plenties. Um, you can't use them at the post office uh, and you can't use them to pay your taxes. I'm not sure why that is. It probably has its head in the sand or something. How many dollars in Oh, I don't know the answer to that. I think that at its high, it might have been $16,000 worth, something like that, and uh, no idea what what's going on now. Yeah? Um, I remember when I first moved here in 2005, the first job I had was actually working for Larry's, going around collecting vegetables at the local restaurant. Um, it was fun and it was disgusting. Um, but that was right around the time that I started to notice that some of those grease traps were getting locked up and um, people that we had friendly relationships all of a sudden had broker deals with other collectors. I'm just curious to know since then what kind of mechanisms you guys have come up with as far as incentivizing those local people to give you their grease or you don't have to go detail about Price yeah, no, we pay. We pay the restaurants for every gallon we pick up. So, and actually, one of the things we we have done successfully is because we have drivers. These drivers are also eaters, right? So one of the things we do when we're getting a new restaurant account, it's like I can guarantee you that uh, you'll have new faces in your restaurant because we've got these like you know weirdos running around on this fuel. Who are who? We have a we have a mobile app that Katie is about to launch. I think on Monday, and it's uh, basically um, you know I'm in the mood for Mexican. I'm in Cary. What are the Mexican places in Cary where Piedmont gets their grease? Boom, up it comes on your uh, phone. And we've got members that like slip little um, cards in their tip that say you know uh, compliments to the chef. I got here tonight on fuel made from your cooking oil. Um, and so we've managed to successfully tie our eaters. We, we did grease appreciation nights. So we'll, we'll talk to the restaurateur and say, what's your bad night? Like, Tuesdays suck. Okay. And we'll, we'll bring 20 or 30 people out to the restaurant on a Tuesday night uh, as a show of uh, support for, for getting their grease. Um, and we also will mail out gift certificates to our members. So we'll go to the restaurants and buy gift certificates and we'll mail them out to our members. And I'm not sure what that value is. I think you maybe you get fifty dollars worth of gifts a year. Is that true, Katie? You actually, from what I'm finding out, the fifty dollars membership is paying for itself because I mail out gift cards probably every other month to people that are. Working I see. Okay, so I need to work out in your pitch. Going to the rest of <laughs> <laughs> so even if you have a gas car, you should be joining us. Even if you don't need our food. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you just bought it, and you don't have a diesel. You could become a member just to. Just for the gifts of Jim. Yeah, it drives them to come into the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know. I think it's better to push the gas car into the lake than switch to a diesel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had one other. There we go. Yeah. I feel like kind of the main, one of the main themes from your presentation was it's about the people and kind of saying that when we got distracted from that, sort of failed a little bit. But I was wondering if you could articulate a little bit more about why it's about the people and how, is that because you need the people to be economically viable or is it because you get a sense of fulfillment that you feel is like important to your work? Just kind of talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's, 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 it's more than economic viability. It's that, um, you know, what's the point? What's the point of growing this uh, labor-intensive, expensive food or making this uh, artisanal fuel if nobody wants to run around on it or nobody wants to eat it? Uh, what's the point of uh, you know, developing clean energy projects if nobody cares and, and would be just as uh, interested in, in coal or, or natural gas? So, I mean, that's the message. Matt got to learn the same lesson um, in some of your uh, urban design work that, uh, that you've done in Raleigh, right? It's, 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 it's you guys, it's these heads in seats that are the sort of the straw that stirs the drink and um, you know it's very easy for us to get sort of so into um, you know motors or uh, filter changes or these kinds of things that we we lose sight of the fact that it's you know 
interacting in 3D is probably the important thing. Thanks. To all the social media folks out there. Yes? Um, you said that what you do can't be scaled. And I was just wondering, because I can relate to that just in the kind of work that I do, and I just wondered, is there a starter kit that you have if a community came to you and said, we want to do what you're doing? Yeah, we do. We, we have a fairly active consulting business. And, um, and what happens with biodiesel is sometimes you make money, and then sometimes you don't. Sometimes you make money, and sometimes you don't. So actually, first quarter of 2011, uh, sorry, first quarter of 2012, biodiesel looked like genius. And when it looked like genius, we were booked, you know, go to Louisville, Charlotteville, Sh Charleston, like everyone wants community skill biodiesel in their town. And, and I was like driving all over the place. Um, second quarter, things started to soften. Third quarter, people making biodiesel sort of looked like idiots. Fourth quarter, put a fork in it. And all of the energy is gone. Come back to uh, 2013, again, we're looking very good in the first quarter. Phone's starting to ring again. We, we have a pretty active consultancy business that we do at Piedmont. And uh, so we can always tell the health of the industry by just sitting around the control room and seeing how many times the phone rings. Because as plants get boarded up, as the industry contracts, and then they you know come back to life, um, we often get called uh, to help on regulatory or fuel quality or you know technical stuff. Yes? What do you think are the factors that cause Policy. It's it's about um, our government and what our government, uh, where our government <laughs> wants renewable energy. So, uh, for instance, uh, well, let's let's think about the Republican platform for the fall, the last quarter of 2012. You know, uh, basically, it's over for wind, solar, bio, everything. Cancel it. That was like, it was in Tampa. They wrote the platform. They put it in there, and it's like very clear. The Republicans were going to go fossil, and it looked like the Republicans were going to win. You know, all interest in renewable energy just dissipated. So you were going to write a check to go into renewable energy, not in Q4 2012 you were. Oh, suddenly uh, Obama wins, and he comes back and says, you know what, we need renewables in our mix. We've got to uh, keep promoting this, and uh, um, so come surging back. You know, energy is all, and the price of energy is entirely a function of government. So the reason these lights are, what are they, like 50 watt bulbs that are recessed and really putting out mostly heat and very little light, um, are actually, uh, what, 7.9 cents a kilowatt hour? That's because the Utilities Commission says that's what uh, we're going to pay. Which means, by the way, there's no real incentive in North Carolina to bother turning the light off when you're not using it. That's energy as a function of government. Back to your question for a minute, though, about scale. When you get into climate change and you get into peak oil, you get into these concepts that are so unfathomably complex that it can be debilitating. And so the, I, I try to think in the scale of me. But that's what I can get my head around. I can get my head around the scale of my family, our fleet, and what we're doing from a conservation perspective and a solar perspective and a uh, biodiesel perspective. And so if you stay in the scale of you, um, you can avoid the impossibility of the fact that it doesn't scale. That's my take on that. Like all these guys that went up to Keystone, they, this big successful protest in the Keystone pipeline the other day, right? It was fantastic. What, 40,000 people on the mall, and it's like, got it. They all got in their gas cars and drove to Keystone <laughs> to protest the pipeline that's going to bring them the gas. The oil to be made into gasoline. It's like, oh, you know, jump on the biodiesel powered buses and go protest the pipeline. It's, anyway, it's crazy. Well, any last questions? Or just about at the end of our time. So thank you so much, Lyle. Well, once again, and thank everyone here who made it out early in the morning. Um, it's truly been amazing to see how many folks, uh, this is now month seven, have continually filled out pretty much every seat in the house 
every month. So thank you so much. Um, next month, uh, the theme will be the future. Um, and we're going to send out more information about uh, the date for that uh, pretty soon. And if you haven't yet, we do have a MailChimp list that if, if, if you do want to get updates, we only send one or two emails out a month at most. Um, it's, uh, there is a sheet at the front. So, uh, so thanks again, and uh, have a wonderful Friday.